Some of you know this week I attended my favorite conference at the Palmer House this week, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, a social justice conference named after a black minister, preacher, and theologian, Samuel DeWitt Proctor, by those he taught and formed. It was founded by Reverend Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright, Jr., Dr. Ivor Carruthers, and Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III. As always, it was wonderful, mostly because it was a family reunion of just some wonderful students and practitioners of theology, all seeking the truth and preparing to be truth tellers, seeking to lead prophetic ministries, seeking to bring about change so that all may be free and so that all of creation may flourish. I see Robert smiling because he was there as well. This was my first year to be invited to be a presenter, along with my colleague, Reverend Derek Weston from Creation Justice Ministries. What an honor and what a great session we had on the topic, connecting the dots, racism, eco-justice, and the wealth gap. In addition to teaching, I always learned something from the Proctor Conference, and this year what intrigued me most was not what I learned from other theologians and preachers, but what I learned from journalist Joy Reid. She was there promoting her book titled Medgar Evers, Medgar, excuse me, and Murley, Medgar Evers and the Love Story That Awakened America. And she briefly spoke about something called red letter Christianity. Anybody ever heard of that? Red letter Christianity. Red letter referring to the words of Jesus being printed in red in most Bibles. Ms. Reed described red letter Christianity as the Christianity of Jesus that adheres to the principles directly out of the mouth of Jesus, such as love and prioritizing the orphan and the widow and those who are sick and immigrants. She called it the God is love version of Christianity that prioritizes, and she said really prioritizes the poor, the sick, the widow, the immigrant, and the stranger. Now, High Park Union, you all know this is not a new concept for me. I preach it almost every time I preach because it is indeed the gospel. What's new and news to me is what some people call it, red letter Christianity. For not all forms of Christianity, as Foster just told us, as Dr. Foster Pinkney, excuse me, just told us, not all forms of Christianity adhere to the words of Jesus. Some Christians have beliefs that totally oppose Jesus' teachings. So for those who are uncomfortable with sermons that are just as focused and that call us to use Joy Reid's words to prioritize, really prioritize the poor and the sick and those who are immigrants, the marginalized of society and the like, Look up red letter Christianity. Now, disclaimer, I haven't looked it up. I don't know all of its teaching, but it is interesting to me. It's a thing. It's not just my thing or Pastor Sarah's thing or Pastor Joanne's thing. It's a thing. And as a matter of fact, if I wrote a book and named our faith, I'd call it red letter and red action Christianity. Because to understand our faith, we must look closely both at what Jesus said and what Jesus did, red letters and red action. And it would be a really good spiritual discipline for Lent and otherwise to study the red letters. That is what Jesus said in the Gospels and pay close attention to what Jesus did and then allow the Spirit to speak to you about what you might say and do in your life as a follower of Christ. That's what we're going to do today in hopes that it helps us have a closer walk with God through Jesus Christ. Today's scripture is certainly one where the words of Christ, the red letters, if you will, in the days leading up to his crucifixion can give us guidance for Lenten practice. 
leading up to our remembrance of the crucifixion and all that followed. So here are the red letters from Mark 8, 34. If anyone, if any, excuse me, want to become my followers, Jesus said, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. The denying oneself, maybe that's where some of the Lenten practices come from, but it's not in the sentence alone. There's a conjunction there, and, which means joining what precedes the and with what follows. And what follows is take up their cross and follow me. If we come to understand what it means to take up our cross and follow Jesus, we'll have a better sense of the denial that Jesus is talking about in the red letters that precede the cross. So let's talk about the cross. What strikes me most about this text, Dr. J, is indeed the reference to the cross. Think about it. This is pre-crucifixion. This is the first prediction of Jesus' death, so the people don't even know that Jesus is going to be crucified. I know what we hear Jesus saying when we hear him say, take up your cross. We know he was crucified. So some of us erroneously translate Jesus' words, take up your cross, as a call to suffer. Some Christians believe suffering is redemptive and it's an act of faith. I, hear me say, don't ascribe to that because it can get out of control and justify unjustifiable suffering. But that's what we may hear when we hear take up your cross because we know Jesus died on the cross, a cross. But what does Jesus' audience hear that day? And what do they think he means when he says take up your cross and follow me? I can imagine some of them were shocked thinking to themselves take up what? And follow you? The cross? Is he mad? Has Jesus lost his mind? Remember, the cross has become a symbol for Christianity for us. But it was not a symbol for their faith. For them, the cross was an execution apparatus. So I am positive that many of them were thinking, why would I take up an execution apparatus? Jesus is indeed asking them to take up an execution apparatus. Why would he do that? It might help to understand this execution apparatus. And here I want to give a shout out to Sean Jr., once again, who nailed it, no pun intended, during confirmation class. When I asked the students what they knew about crucifixion, Sean Jr. said something close to this. Crucifixion was a form of capital punishment to publicly disgrace the person being crucified so that those watching the execution would be afraid to do what the person hanging on the cross did. Amen. And somebody say, thank God for Sean Jr. And for those who have taught him and he so eloquently explained crucifixion. So the cross, as Jesus uses it in this statement before his crucifixion, is not a faith symbol to his audience. It's a symbol of execution by the Roman authorities. It's a symbol of doing something that might lead to your crucifixion. When Jesus said, take up your cross to his audience, he's saying, take up that which the powers that be so vehemently oppose, that they'll want to publicly torture you so that no one else tries what you try. Jesus, even with his crowds and disciples, full knowledge of what a cross is, still told his audience to take up their cross. Again, do that which the powers that be will so oppose that they'll want to crucify you. 
That's why right after saying, those who want to follow me will deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Listen to the rest of the red letters. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake, Jesus says, and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. He's calling them to a behavior which in their day might get them crucified. The intro to this pericope, excuse me, also backs this up. Look at verse 31. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. The elders, the chief priests, and the scribes are the Jewish authorities. Together they form the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of Jerusalem. And, and throughout the Gospels, they oppose and reject Jesus for taking up his cross and ultimately crucified him for his actions that is his ministry to the masses. Jesus, who acts with God's authority, was rejected by those who operated in their human authority. And Jesus was rejected for a reason. He was rejected because they simply did not like what Jesus was doing and who he was doing it for and whom he was helping and healing in the process. Jesus was rejected and ultimately crucified for ministry that the powers that be vehemently opposed. He was rejected and ultimately crucified because the actions he took and the words he spoke were worthy of a divine crown, but it earned him a human cross because his actions threatened the empire. Jesus used the language, take up your cross, to transmit the meaning that things Jesus calls his disciples to do at any point in history are the very things that will always threaten human empires. Exploring the ministry of Jesus and how Jesus took up the cross, in other words, how his actions led him to the cross, might instruct us for taking up the cross for those of us who want to follow the red letters. It's a very Lenten scripture, Mark 8, 43, excuse me, 34. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Let's look at the ways Jesus took up his cross. First, Jesus took up his cross socially and very personally when he fed the multitudes multiple times. When he gave sight to the blind, healed lepers, helped widows, and generally blessed and restored those who were marginalized and outcast in society. So could it be that Jesus was rejected by the empire because when you show the poor, the sick, and the marginalized that what they need, food and health care and somebody to care, is actually not scarce. It's actually abundant. When you show them that they might be more empowered to love their neighbor because they don't think they're in competition for basic needs. Because human needs are plentiful in God's reign and that upsets an empire's power to marginalize and exploit the masses if they know that God will give them what they need and they don't have to rely on human power. Jesus was rejected because his cross included good news to the poor. The good news that there is no lack in God's reign. So this Lenten season, as you take up your cross, you might both demonstrate and advocate for abundance. In the areas where we're made to believe that there's lack, fight for equity and fair wages for education and health care for the poor. Address food scarcity. In these United States of America, housing insecurity, expose and address the wealth gap. Take up your cross of ensuring people's basic needs are met. Take up the cross socially in ways that impact people's lives. Jesus took up his cross socially and personally, but he also took up his cross culturally. Say culturally. He did that which was culturally unacceptable. Like when he spoke to the woman 
at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, when he culturally wasn't supposed to. It's stated right there in John 4, 9 that Jews and Samaritans did not associate with one another. Think about those our society has told us not to associate with. But Jesus broke cultural norms and spoke to her, told her about her life and had compassion on her offering her living water. As a result, she went from being condemned by her culture for so many marriages, that's another sermon for another day, to being an evangelist who said, come and see a man who told me everything I've done. Could this man be the Christ? And she went and got more Samaritans. And could it be that Jesus was rejected because he broke cultural barriers, gender bias, and freed people from the guilt of their past? And when people are not culturally isolated and don't operate in gender bias, but they love diverse communities, and when people are free from guilt from the past, they are more likely to love their neighbor as themselves and therefore are not vulnerable to the fear-mongering of political parties who like to keep people separate but not equal. Jesus was rejected for culturally setting people free from the powers that be for setting the oppressed free, and that directly threatens the empire who feed off people's fear of difference. So take up your cross this season and beyond and break a cultural barrier. Talk to someone society has told you not to talk to. Get to intimately know someone who looks different, acts different, smells different, and sounds different from you. Jesus says those who will lose their life will save it. In other words, your life will be blessed when you embrace Difference, the very difference that the powers that be don't want us to embrace. This Lenten season and beyond, save your life. Get to know someone society has said stay away from. And I am sure you'll be pleasantly surprised, as was the woman at the well. Jesus took up his cross socially, personally, and culturally, but he also took up his cross spiritually when he set free people with demon possession. I didn't make up this Bible. This Bible was, was, was given and put together for us. And it's in there. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus encountered those possessed by demons and stopped evil in its tracks, stopping them from harming themselves and others. And could it be that Jesus was rejected? Because when you free people from demon possession, you free them from evil. For when they are demon-possessed, they don't know what they're doing. That's one of the seven last words. But when they are freed from evil, they too can love themselves and love others. And could it be that Jesus was rejected by the empire? Because when you exercise evil, you greatly hinder that which fuels the empire itself. Some of us encounter evil on a daily basis. And as a Lenten practice, we need to pray for those who are operating in evil. We need to commit them to prayer. We need to ask God how and whether to engage them. Sometimes you've got to protect yourself from evil. And when we, and we need to recognize what Paul called spiritual wickedness in high places and do the work to prevent such wickedness from gaining power, a good Lenten practice here would actually be voter registration. Need I say more? Lastly, Jesus carried his cross religiously. Say religiously. By forgiving people of their sins and demonstrating the highest law of love and by healing on the Sabbath. Breaking a primary religious law of the day. And could it be that Jesus was rejected because when people aren't downtrodden by guilt of sin, feeling like they've let God down because they couldn't keep the hundreds of commandments and not even the main ten, 
When they're free from that guilt, then they are free to keep the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. For love covers a multitude of sins. And when people are not burdened by guilt, they are free to love. And when people are loved, they are healed. And, when, and then there is less trauma in the world, and people can become all that God has created them to be. Jesus was rejected because the powers that be did not want him freeing people from the law. Because if they were free from the law, those experts of the law would be out of a job. Jesus was rejected for a reason. Jesus came to demonstrate and usher in the reign of God. His mission was to start a movement that was antithetical to the reign of man and evil, a movement towards the reign of God, for God is love and God is just. To do so, he set people free from that which made them so reliant on human authorities. He demonstrated abundance, abundant healing, abundant food, Remember, he fed the, the multitudes, and they still were able to pick up 12 baskets. Abundant liberation, freedom from oppression and guilt and evil, and freedom from fear of difference. Jesus offered freedom. And the authorities were threatened. They did not want people free. They did not want people knowing that all they needed was actually in abundance. They did not want people engaging and certainly not loving those who were different. They wanted to keep people separate. They did not want to free people from the law. So Jesus took up his cross. They ultimately put him on a cross, but he had already told his disciples to take up your cross. Do that which the powers that be don't want us doing, and that's the same message he has for us today. So if you're looking for a way to take up your cross and follow Jesus, find a way to empower the disempowered. Look for ways to make plentiful that which the government and capitalists would like us to believe is scarce. Don't only pray for the poor, but advocate for policies that eradicate poverty. Befriend someone you've been told to stay away from. Break down invisible barriers. Recognize evil when you see it. And pray and vote. Pick up a cross. Pick up what? Yes, the red letters today say deny yourself, which now seems to mean take a risk. Get out your comfort zone. Do something counter to the norm which has been shaped by empire and do something for someone other than yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross might just help us help others experience God. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake it says in red letters, and for the sake of the gospel, we'll save it. Another meaning for salvation. God bless you.